and we have none other than the president of Tectelic, the wonderful, the amazing Roman Namish. Give it up for Roman. Thank you. Well, welcome again. Um, so I think everybody knows Tectelic. We manufacture a lot of gateways, especially carry great gateways. And today I'll be talking not so much about the gateways, but more about the devices and, and part of the ecosystem, how we make sure that there's a mass adoption. Um, kind of, you know, these days you, you hear a lot about when people discuss about it, the, um, there are a lot of issues with IoT. And if you go and check, you know, if you do a Google search and find out, well, what are the issues with IoT? you'll find that there's literally hundreds, if not thousands, of listed issues. But in reality, we all know that it's impossible to have so many issues because we can't really manage them. So if you're running a company, you, know, you, might, you might have 50 issues or so per day, but you're only t taking care of one or two. So you know, looking at the Google research, there seems like there's a lot of complexity, and everybody's, you know, typically you'll see things like security and data privacy as some of the issues that are very common would be here. Oh, sorry, I should go back. Um, would be actually something shown here, but I mean, reality is the, book, the bigger the, the, bigger the um, agency, they produce some really exotic graphs that it's really hard to understand what it means. And interesting enough, you know, let's say you pick one of the best, actually, uh, you know, we'll call it like uh, agencies, and say, what exactly they publish, right? What, did, what, did, what do they say our issues are today with IoT? And interesting enough, you'll notice things like, you know, poor market research is one of the top items. So maybe internet stakeholders or inefficient security or lack of internet knowledge. And what you're starting to realize that, at least when you look in today, that that's not really the problem that we are facing with. And you really need to understand what are the true real problems. So what I'm trying to say is when you look at these things, sometimes you have to be really conscientious that are those the real problems or are those are the maybe the solutions that some agency wants you to push to them, right? And I'm just picking one of them in this particular case. You can look at any one. So let's look at three technologies because they haven't been really successful until now. Um, if you look at the cellular IoT that really started in 2018 or so, we noticed that um, the biggest problem with the cellular IoT is not so much the technology, it's, it's really the fact that the business model is very difficult today. Number one, the connectivity is still too expensive for a typical consumer. And number two, that's actually from a cost point of view. And from a price point of view, the operators cannot make any money. So there's a huge disconnect for the typical seller operators. Number two, the bigger problem even is that the opportunity size today is typically one, two, three, maybe four million dollars when you look at the, some kind of IoT deployments, and, and cellular operators would be looking typically for 50 or 20 million dollar plus. So huge disconnect, and that's why a lot of WAN can pick up a lot of business. When we look at the sick fogs that was recently, I think, uh, changed the hands of uh, ownership. Really, it, it was a $350 million investment that was recently purchased back for, let's say, or maybe purchased for $20 million. Um, it, reality, what happened there was it wasn't so much the technology issue as the real the business model. The business model of SecFoz had, I would say, fundamentally two flaws. Number one, it was about all exclusivity. It means, uh, I mean, SecFox would operate the global network. They will pick a one partner in every country, they would have exclusive rights to deploy the network and then operate it. Well, you can imagine if any company in IoT were told, unless you're like in Belgium, a small country, but if you're in a large country, you can't really scale if you're a startup to cover the entire country. So having exclusivity wasn't really a benefit, it was a detriment. Number two, um, licensing model of 40% from the top line was really something they couldn't afford. So really what was happening, every operator that deployed even SecFox network, they couldn't really become profitable probably, you know, not now, not in the future, if they had to actually pay licensing fee of 40% to the, to the uh, operator. So that's kind of a thought tells you the second, you know, second technology. From a technology point of view, I think there isn't really no much difference between, I would say, you know, from a technical point of view between the SecFox and, and LoRaWAN or even NBIoT and, and uh, LoRaWAN, right, from a technical point of view. There are some differences, but it's not really what's causing the slowdown. When we look at the helium, 
it's kind of interesting because Helium is really LoRaWAN. And they deploy today like uh, three, well, 950,000 miners or really gateways, uh, but they don't have any users. Like literally, there's no users today uh, with their deployments. So it's really, they never really planned to really build a true LoRaWAN network. What they did plan really was more about um, blockchain technology and a cryptocurrency and, and, and paying people, obviously, for those that understand, paying people uh, in, a, in a coverage or paying Helium cryptocurrency really for the, providing the coverage, but it wasn't really designed for real deployment. So looking at three examples, it is quite apparent that the failures were not because of a technology, but because of poor ROI if you look into it. And then just so to make a point, um, with the Helium specifically, uh, it's, it's a kind of a little bit of a mess right now because what's happened, right, if you don't think about it, that's kind of the logic is, if you don't think who are your users are going to use the network, what use cases are, you can end up with a billion dollar business or maybe even more that has no value for it. And today, I mean, everybody knows last year or so there were a lot of, last year or so there was a lot of actually uh, shortages for the parts and you could, nobody could build gateways and other things. And in part because, because every supplier was providing actually uh, parts to build helium miners. And today there's a flood of helium miners, but they're really not doing any good for anybody. And the reality is these miners today, I mean, six months ago you couldn't buy them for $1,000 and today they're $400 to $600. They're literally tens of thousands of them on eBay. And the thing is that a $10, oh sorry, $10, $100 LoRaWAN gateway will do a better job for LoRaWAN than any of these helium miners because they're much more reliable. So, so what Tectelic is doing right now, because we have a lot of gateways, we want to now become, really drive the IoT adoption. And we looked and we said, okay, let's look at real customers, real issues. What are those issues today that we see? And what we realized, you know, we have over 400 customers. What we realized is that any public LoRaWAN network is, really has a slow adoption. And partly it's because there are big deployments, they have to support lots of different use cases, and things there, that's where it's slowed down. Any enterprise network, or like a business network, they're actually doing exceptionally well. Because they have a small problem, they understand the problem, they find the use case, they, somebody deploys it, and they're up and running. But larger networks have a hard time. Number two, we realize that companies who deploy poor equipment, they tend to um, they, 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 they cannot roll up fast because what happens, poor equipment will slow you down. You would need to go and redeploy equipment or change the gateways or constantly monitor it, things like that. Number three, one of the problem is, it's kind of becoming really close to heart. That's why we're discussing here is, there are today lots of sensors, I'll put it in this way, but there are very few fully integrated solutions. And it takes a long time to take from the sensor to provide an application and then integrate it and make it available for somebody to test it and prove that that works. And that's really many companies, in, the, in other words, companies who build today sensors, they don't take the time to make it a complete solution and make it sure it's very easily be integratable with somebody. And I think we'll talk what we do for that. And the last one is really there's still too much dependency on LoRaWAN knowledge. So it hasn't been really brought down to level that you can send it a gateway and device, let's say, to a nurse, to a teacher, to somebody, and they can deploy it and test it. So I think that's what we need to do to really get adoption going. So how do we going to go around that to do it? Like, and, and then, so this was kind of the problems, and now I'm looking saying, well, what are the solutions to solve these problems? Because that's the best way to do that. And we identified, because in addition to having like 14 different gateways, we have now over 22 or 23 different sensors and devices, we'll call it devices, sensors, and applications. And we had some success and we had some really bad failures. Um, and I think we had success with those devices that when we really understood the problem we were solving, and if that was kind of imaginary problem that was not really good because we had a solution, perfect solution, but we couldn't really find a problem for a perfect solution. So it's really important to identify a problem and understand the problem. Um, and understanding the problem sometimes can be tricky. Then it's very important to make sure when we solve the, the build the device, we really make it very easy for somebody to test it. 
it cannot be just simply a wonderful device, a sensor, but, but you give it to somebody and then it takes them three months to configure and make it work. So today, when we offer our sensors, they come with an app. You can test it with a phone, literally. You just go download an app from Apple Store, and you can test it. We have done that yesterday with our workshop. The next thing is, if somebody got your device, and they have an app, and they test it, said, yeah, it solves my problem, then the next question is, well, how are you going to scale? And the way to scale it, you have to develop now an application and make it with an open API that anybody can integrate in any kind of IoT platform. Because you cannot force today any company to say, you must use my application. What you need to do is to say, hey, we develop a solution, and it comes with an open API, and anybody can use it in any kind of IoT platform and, and actually help them. And that's how we do with the gateways. We have the largest portfolio of the gateways. We support every network server on the planet Earth. We never limit anybody. And we do the same with the devices. We have to encourage people to help others to be successful. And obviously, the last item is we want to make sure then you take, you have an engineering support people very capable of assisting your customers integrating in their IoT platforms. Only then we can move in it fast. What Winky said that today we can go from the concept, from a product POC to real deployment in about three months. And we, we've done probably between three to five, six months. But real, from the start of the POC to the time it's mass deployment. A year ago, it would take us a year on average to do it. But it, a lot of work to prepare for this. Um, so really, the, the right thing to think about it, how to do mass, you know, in, in order to assist with mass IoT adoption, it really have to be thinking how you're going to assist your customers to spend less time introducing your solutions. So what did we introduce today that really works and works really well, right? And I'll give you some examples here, but you can go to our booth, which is right at the front there. So we have a Tempo solution. And, and by the way, Tectalic solutions are all very little bit somewhat complex. We don't really like to build very simple temperature sensor, temper, uh, temperature monitor and, and a humidity because there are lots of them available right now. So we're trying to do something a little bit more comprehensive. So we have a Tempo solution. It's a fully integrated um, uh, e-ink display. Um, oh, sorry. I just have to go back. Wrong one. It's a fully integrated e-ink display, six inch with like um, smart room sensors. And it's integrated as well with the Outlook calendar and, uh, and um, Google calendar. So you, you can put these devices, you can imagine, like on, on any kind of a meeting room. And it will tell you if the meeting room is booked or not booked. You can actually grab a meeting room if it's available just by pushing the button, or you can release the things like that. It also comes with lots of analytics. If somebody booked a meeting room but not in the room, because we can tell through this presence detect, then it's going to send you a reminder saying, unless you go in a meeting room, um, uh, we're going to release it right now. So, so there's a lot of analytics available right now with this device. The next one is kind of based upon that. It's a memo so a solution is considered. Also comes with application. Um, what it does have, it has a, a similar idea. It has a display, six-inch display, we can, we can, which can be graphical display, text display. It could be used for announcements, could be used for a menu, could be used for any information you would like to display. In my office, it sits. It says, you know, my office, Roman Nemesh, and it tells maybe what time I'm available. Right now, it says I'm traveling. So people know shouldn't come there because I'm not in the office today. Uh, very simple. And you can also connect, let's say, like an environmental monitor device so you can display temperature, humidity, CO2, any information. And it, again, gives you analytics. We use these devices quite often in the universities to say, you know, which particular auditorium have what classrooms, things like that but used for a lot of different applications. And again, when we provide this to the customers today, they don't need to even talk to us. They have the software. They can customize it. They can do everything what they need you know, with that application. Um, we talked about the eDoctor. I think um, um, Johan was wearing the device. It's been now actually went through medical approvals. It is really, it's really designed to monitor patients in a hospital. It monitors all your vital signs. and. Nurse doesn't have to go and check up on the patients every one, two, or three, well, or four hours, depending what the protocol is. Uh, it it is, took a lot of time to develop it to really to, to make sure it's working very well, but you can come to our booth and, and see it, how it's done. And, and it operates, obviously, on a 
2477 battery Seacoin for three months. So you get literally everything. And the key element you get is a breathing or respiratory rate. That's very, very important. Then if you look at the next one, and again, I'm not going to go through all our devices, but I think the, the following that is we have called an e-beat. Um, so the e-doctor goes on the chest, and it's a device that gives you also lots of vital signs about positioning, if you sleep, how much you rotate, things like that. Um, but in many applications, or many maybe use cases for in hospitals or nursing homes, you don't need that, a lot of information. So an e-beat is a more practical solution. It's more like a smartwatch, but it goes on an arm. Um, and it gives you the same information. It doesn't really give you a lot of about body position, but it does give you SpO2 or, or, or level of oxygen in a bloodstream. Um, this device is just right now going through the final integration. We have samples here, and uh, we believe there's a six big success in this area because um, people know probably in the U.S. Uh, medical system is really expensive. It's like 25% of, uh, of uh, GDP goes towards medical system. And the idea is you want to to save it. You want to make sure that you don't let people to be critically ill before you, before you actually can assist them. And the last one I want to say is called Breeze. And really, Breeze is just a, it's environmental monitoring. It's a temperature, humidity, CO2, PM2.5 a device with a display. And that display can be positioned anywhere you would like to have. Maybe teacher can have in front of them. And the device can be in a location where it's actually not exposed to any kind of moving air. The interesting thing is we had yesterday um, a customer event here uh, downtown. Uh, we have about 45 people or so, and they all were able to download and, and get their device. They took it home, and they, they just went to Apple Store, downloaded our Breeze application, they scanned the device, and everything worked, and they took it home to monitor their environment. We made it as simple as that. There was no instructions, no, nothing to do other than just download, scan, and see, see it work. Of course, the device were pre-configured to run on the TTN network. That's the only thing we had to do. So, Kind of in closing, if I was to say, you know, from my, from my experience in the last maybe two or three years in LoRaWAN, um, and we have obviously a lot of experience before that in the wireless industry, how can we help to drive IoT adoption? Because we talked about three use cases, three different kind of a technology. We talked about the cellular, the, the, the SigFox, and the, and the helium. And when we look at maybe there, I wouldn't say there are failures, but I would simply say there is a lack of success and it's a very slow adoption. Um, the reason slow adoption happens is not because of a technology. And I don't believe today when people come and sometimes people argue about, well, SigFox is better than LoRaWAN, LoRaWAN is better than SigFox and NBOT or CATAM. The reason for slow adoption are all about related to business and they're all related to very low ROI. And because it takes long to, because, because ROI is very poor, let's say, or low, people don't want to invest more money, and that's really what that kind of hamstrings our development. So what we really need to do to be successful, we believe is, first of all, and that's based on our experience, identify a real problem. Don't try to build another device that somebody has. Identify a problem that you can really address. Then make sure you address that problem and you develop a, a, a very simple way to make sure that somebody can go and test the use case for that problem. So you have to offer somebody uh, a, a very quick, maybe call it a quick and dirty solution that they can go and check and test and say, yeah, it's working, without investing any techno technical knowledge and time on their side or your side. And I would say a smartphone is a good example. It doesn't have to be a completely vetted solution, but it has to be something that can work. Today, we, we send our solutions directly to schools, uh, nurses, uh, um, um, even um, churches. So a nun can deploy our solution without knowing anything about LoRaWAN. If they say, yeah, it's working, it addresses, yeah, it makes sense, then you need to make sure you have some kind of a comprehensive application uh, or platform that, that you can monitor, obviously, many schools and classrooms and develop analytics. That's quite expensive and time consuming. And if you don't have the resources, I would, I would simply say you want to partner with somebody that you can develop it. However, don't develop it such a way that it's yours and only they must use your 
complete solution because many companies will not be able to do that. They have to integrate in their IoT platforms. So make sure you make it available with a clear API that companies can integrate it. The thing to understand is it does, you still can get paid for monthly recurring revenue. It just means it has to be working with somebody else. You don't have to tie them together. It doesn't mean that if somebody is using your, not using your actually a final application or IoT platform, you're not going to get paid for it. Those are separate items. And then obviously make sure you have good engineers behind, help integrate the first maybe two or three times early customers to make sure it's all working okay. And don't forget, I would say, IoT is not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's definitely, we've been now in this for I think five years or so. We have a lot of experience in, a, in a wireless development. So for us, LoRaWAN is fairly easy, but it's still, you know, you cannot shrink the time, right? It doesn't matter, people say, people kind of joke, like, it doesn't matter if you have the first child or the tenth child, it still takes 10 months or so, or eight, nine months to, to have a healthy baby. So I think the same is here. It's for sure takes that experience and time. Once you've done it a few times, you can deploy it. So I think that's about it, and thank you. Thank you so much, Roman. That was